Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome. It is Tuesday of Holy Week, and we're doing a, a daily check-in as we go through this uh, unique time. And I uh, just uh, wanted to say good morning and bless you. We're going to uh, keep going. Yesterday, we, we talked about uh, Jesus encountering the fig tree and em entering the temple in Jerusalem on Monday of Holy Week, and today is Tuesday. Uh, if you'll remember, let's set a little context here. Most of the action is happening in Jerusalem. Jesus and his disciples are staying in a town called Bethany, about two miles from Jerusalem. They're going back and forth, uh, commuting into Jerusalem uh, during the day. And yesterday we saw Jesus curse a fig tree. Uh, we saw him clear the temple. And today is Tuesday. Jesus and the disciples are back. I want, before we get started in uh, Mark chapter 11, I want to uh, give you a place to follow along if you uh, have your Bible and want to read along. Uh, I would just want to get uh, check in with you and see how you did yesterday. Did you? Uh, our charge and challenge yesterday was to see how Jesus laid claim to the fig tree and to the temple, and ask: Are we allowing Jesus to lay claim to our lives? To uh, place a claim on what is his, our words, our deeds, and our actions, and um, in our hearts, our meditations, uh, the things we think about. How'd you do yesterday? Did you turn those things over to Jesus? Did you allow him to have your words, have your deeds, have your meditations? Well, if you didn't, if you didn't hit a home run yesterday, <laughs> maybe you struck out, uh, that's okay. It's Tuesday. Grace is amazing. Let's give it a, a good shot today. Let's start over. And and I want to follow up. Uh, there's some things in, in Mark chapter 11 as we read about Tuesday of Holy Week, the last week of the incarnation, um, Christ's ministry on earth in the flesh. Uh, there's some things that I think are very applicable to our particular time. So I'm in Mark chapter 11. I'm going to pick up in verse 20. Uh, this is titled, The Lesson from the Fig Tree. In the morning, as they pass by, again, we have a time stamp here from Mark, uh, Mark, the companion of Peter. Uh, in the morning, so it's on Tuesday morning, they pass by and they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Now, understand this. I don't know. Uh, in the email I sent out, uh, I, I uh, included a picture of a fig tree. You see that this is a substantial tree. It is significant. Um, yesterday we read that the leaves were evident, everything looked fine, it looked healthy. Uh, so within 24 hours, this tree has completely withered. It is a miraculous uh, tra uh, transaction that's happened here, uh, transformation, uh, not for the better. The tree has withered and died. It has withered from the roots up. So obviously something significant has happened. Uh, so verse 21, Peter, uh, calling to remembrance what Jesus had said, said to uh, Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Jesus answered them, have faith in God, for truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and thrown into the sea, and does so with no doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, and he who have and he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. And when you stand praying, forgive. For if you have anything against anyone, so that your father who... Forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your father who is in heaven may also forgive your sins. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your sins. Now, I want to hone in on one part of a verse here. Uh, what I would say is the big idea of what Jesus uh, explains here and what is subtitled, the lesson from the fig tree. It says, whoever believes and does not have doubt in their heart. Here's the big idea of this passage, this lesson, and I'm going to try to keep it succinct today. I realized yesterday was about 15 minutes. I want to keep it shorter than that so you can just uh, check in real quick and, and go on without your day, uh, or go on about your day. And uh, look, here's the big idea from this, this passage. Whoever does not have doubt in their heart. Do we have doubt in their heart? Think about it. Why does Israel wander in the wilderness for an additional generation? Because they had doubt. Why does Peter go from water walking to drowning? 
because he gives way to doubt. Let's think about this. How can doubt impact our experience? Hey, we can go from quarantine thriving to tremendous struggle because of doubt, because of fear, because of wondering if God is able, if God is strong enough. That's what Peter does on the water. He, he, is, he is looking at Jesus, and when he has confidence, God confidence, and he has his eyes fixed on Jesus, he is, he is doing something miraculous, something significant. But the minute he turns that over and surrenders to doubt, he drowns. Look, in this quarantine, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, if we stay focused, if we have God confidence, we can experience something incredible. But if we turn that confidence to doubt, I think we're going to struggle. So let's think about this. Let's allow God to do something amazing in this time. In this unprecedented quarantine. I don't know about you, but uh, as a pastor and a basketball coach, it was just a few weeks ago in the, in the throes of basketball season where I was burning the candle at both ends. I was praying and begging for a week off. Well, now in a short period of time, I'm praying and begging for a week on. I would love to get back to the normal pace of life and be out and about and, and be in our Bible studies and small groups and, and, and programs and worship and uh, practice and open gym and, and have our family routines. I would love for all those things to be back. But I also have an opportunity. Here's, here's how I'm thinking. I also have an opportunity to experience a season like I've I've never been given in my life. And I, I got to ask myself, how can I turn this season from fear or doubt to faith and God confidence? How can I take this time and make the most of it? What, what can I read? What can I study? What can I pray about? How can I add spiritual disciplines, exercise, change my diet, do, do all those things that I've always said I would love to do, but I don't have the time to do them. Now I've got time. And I got more time than I've ever wanted. How can I go from fear and doubt and questioning and, and grumbling and why and, and missing and longing for uh, normalcy to saying, hey, this is an unprecedented opportunity. I hope, I don't expect that we'll ever be in a, a, a six, eight-week quarantine again. I hope, I hope we never experience that again. But we are. How can we make the most of it? How can we thrive in this time? And, and if we go on to what happened later in the afternoon in Mark 11, I think it continues to, to tie into this. It says, They came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking into the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. They said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority to do them? Now, remember yesterday on Monday, Jesus had come and he had cleansed the temple. He had kicked out the money changers. And hey, look, let's be honest. Uh, if anybody came into our church, one of our churches, in the middle of a service or as we're preparing for a program and came and started yelling and screaming and throwing people out and turning things over, we would ask the same question. Who do you think you are? What gives you the right to come in here and, and do this and upset the apple cart and, and turn things over? Who do you think you are? That's basically the, the question that the religious leaders are asking. Verse 29, Jesus answered them, I will ask, also ask one question of you. And answer me, and, I'll t and then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? They debated among themselves, saying, well, if we say it came from heaven, then Jesus will say, uh, then why didn't you believe? But if we say that the baptism of John came from men, they, that, well, then the people will get upset. So the answer to Jesus, we don't know. Now, he, I'm going to 
take this and apply it to our situation, but I, I just want to highlight here something I see. The, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are stuck between two options. They're stuck between their own self-interest, answering in their own self-interest, and answering in a way that would uh, put them in jeopardy with people. They're stuck between their self-interest and a fear of others. I mean, that's what it comes down to here. They're stuck between their own self-interest and a fear of what others might think. And because they're stuck in that place, chasing after their own interests, but being afraid of what others might think, they, they don't get to the right answer. <laughs> and that's a big deal. If you're a religious leader, you want to answer a religious question the right way. And they don't get there because they're, they're frozen because of their own self-interest and the fear of others. Hey, look, let's apply this. You know, I know it's a stretch. But let's apply this to our own day and time. You know, do we have God confidence in this time to allow God to do what God wants to do in us? Or are we going to be stuck between our own self-interest and a fear of others? You know, our own self-interest, I don't know about you, but man, my, my sin nature is drawn to sit on the couch, uh, watch TV, maybe, you know, goof around, play a video game, waste time, piddle on the internet, get on my phone. My self-interest is not always to be productive, to be fruitful, to say, hey God, where do you want to take me today? And then we have the fear of others. But if we really use this time to to be transformed, to be renewed. What would people say about us? What would people think? You know, if we, if we come out of this quarantine and, and we're, we're transformed and we're renewed and we're uh, strengthened and emboldened in the Lord, you know, what would people think about me? I want to imagine. Imagine if you came out of this quarantine time like a butterfly emerging from a cocoon, new life, transformation is evident. It's clear to everybody. God has done something powerful you in you in this quiet time. Imagine how beautiful that would be. Friends, I hope this is encouraging. Allow Jesus to take this time captive. To lay claim to your heart, your words, your deeds. To draw you into study, reflection, spiritual disciplines, uh, self-renewal and restoration and improvement. To be the person that you felt convicted to be, to do the things you felt convicted to do, but have always said, I don't have time to do them. We've got time. Let's offer it to the Lord for his purposes in us. Grace and peace.